All right, everyone, welcome to the afternoon session. I uh, hope you had a good lunch. Um, our first speaker for today uh, in the afternoon is Anima Anankumar. Anima was, uh, did a P her PhD at Cornell in 2009, uh, followed by a postdoc at MIT, and since then has been an assistant professor here at UC Irvine. Thanks, Alex, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, making it to the Southern California Symposium, despite the NIPS deadline and so many other things. So in the afternoon, as you've seen, you know, we have a whole set of other talks on more, I would say, on the application side. So in the morning, you saw uh, some of the theoretical underpinnings. And uh, now let me st start you with some of the optimization angle of machine learning. So indeed, I mean, we can think about efficient representations. We can think about you know, nice loss functions. But at the end of the day, we need to deploy them. We need to ask how we can uh, you know, run them on large data sets and to have guaranteed optimization frameworks. Right? And uh, the la latest trend has been to look at non-convex optimization. And today, I will uh, show some of the ways to come up with guaranteed means to do this and to take the theory forward in terms of non-convex optimization. So indeed, uh, you know, the convex optimization is a classical you know, concept that has been very well studied. You know, there is uh, guarantees of in all different regimes. But you know, the new trend is to look at non-convex methods. Right? So if you look at the Google search trends, clearly it's the non-convex optimization on the upswing. And, uh, that's been the fashionable thing to do. So given that people are running all these non-convex methods, can we look at a theory behind it? Can we come up with ways to analyze them? Can we come up with ways to ask when they would succeed and what kinds of answers they would get? So that is what would make machine learning more of a robust uh, framework rather than a trial and error. You know, can we remove? Uh, the uh, you know aspect of a uh, ton of tuning, a ton of uh, you know initialization, and ask when we can come up with guarantees. So let's see how we can go about doing this. Right. So the challenges compared to convex optimization, where we are guaranteed that there is a one unique globally optimal solution, non-convex optimization can have multiple local optima. And this is especially a challenge in high dimensions where uh, you can have an exponential number of local optima. So if you do local search strategies, in general, you, know, you cannot approach the globally optimal solution. So this is for general loss functions. What we'll see today is uh, uh, you know, for a special class of loss functions based on spectral optimization, we can, in fact, overcome this issue of local optima. So this is one issue with non-convex optimization. But there's also another issue that has gotten much less attention. So in addition to local optima in a non-convex problem, you also have saddle points. So these are critical points where you, know, you can make progress. So meaning if you move in certain directions, you can improve the objective function as you're you know, doing the local search. But the problem is how to find these directions of escape. And saddle points are, again, a big issue in non-convex optimization because you can have an exponential number of them in high dimensions. Right? So if you're running local search methods, if you're running stochastic gradient descent, in general, you're slowed down by these saddle points. So how do we design mechanisms to overcome this? How do we design mechanisms that are fast and will converge to good solutions? So I'll show this in the second part of the talk, that in addition to worrying about local optima, we also need to worry about saddle points that slow down our local search methods. And we'll ask, what are the strategies to overcome these saddle points? So those will be the two important aspects uh, when it comes to non-convex optimization. One is mechanisms to you know, reach globally optimal solution and the special cases we can do that. And the more general setting where can we at least hope to escape the saddle points 
and ensure we're making good progress and to get to good solutions in high dimensions. Right, so those will be the concepts that will be covered here. So we'll see now how spectral optimization uh, are a special class of non-convex optimization. Right, so in perhaps the very simplest non-convex problem you can think of is one of matrix decomposition. So you can take a matrix, you can ask to decompose it in terms of its uh, you know, components which are the eigenvectors. So you can write that down in terms of an optimization problem, right? If you want the top eigenvector, you can maximize the quadratic form of the matrix on the sphere, right? So you have the constraint of the vector being on the sphere, so this is a non-convex problem, right? So this is perhaps the simplest non-convex problem. And yet we know we can solve for the eigenvectors. So despite the non-convexity, we know we have guaranteed solutions for matrix decomposition. So how is this possible? Right, so it turns out to the case of this optimization problem for finding the eigenvector of a matrix, you can analyze this very well. So in fact, you can show what are the set of critical points where the gradient vanishes, right? So you can write down the Lagrangian, you can ask where uh, the uh, uh, you know, gradient vanishes, what are the set of points? So those turn out to be the eigenvectors of the matrix and you have at most a linear number of such critical points uh, in your problem. And out of that you can ask these critical points, which one is the stable one, right? Which one is the local optimum? And it turns out there is only one of them that is the local optimum, which is the top one, assuming there is an eigengap. So in this special case, you, you know, even though there is non-convexity, you can show that there is a unique uh, locally optimal solution which is also global, right? So if you did gradient descent with random initialization, you can in fact converge to the top eigenvector. And the power method is essentially a version of that, right? So this is the uh, familiar matrix power method where you take the matrix, you multiply it with the random vector, you normalize and you repeat the process, right? You can prove that it converges to the top eigenvector. And so the idea is, uh, you know, for the case of matrices, uh, despite being a non-convex problem, you can analyze the optimization landscape and characterize what are the set of critical points where the gradient vanishes and also wh what is the set of local optima uh, where, uh, you know, and that's where the gradient descent would converge. So how can we take this further? Are there other non-convex problems for which we can come up with guaranteed analysis? Can we come up with a characterization of the landscape? In general, this is very tough to do, but what I've been looking at is can we take, go from matrices beyond to tensors, right? These are natural generalizations of matrices, so can we expect many of the nice properties of matrix methods to extend beyond to higher order tensors. So uh, how can we think of a tensor? So just as we can, can think of matrix in terms of, um, you know, so I would think of it in terms of representing the moments because we'll see this is also the application we'll be using uh, in terms of learning. So just as you can use a matrix to represent pairwise moments of your data, right? So you take the uh, pairwise correlation of every pair of random variables and you can uh, you know, represent it in that particular entry of the matrix. Similarly, now you can look at representing correlations between every triplet of random variables and you can encode that in that particular entry of the tensor. And so this way you can now encode higher order moments of a multivariate distribution using the notion of tensors. Right, so this is one way to now think of going beyond matrices to tensors. So now we can ask the same question. If I have a tensor, can I find its decomposition, right? So can I decompose the tensor in terms of its rank one components? And uh, if so, what are the algorithms and what is the optimization landscape look like? <coughs> and uh, so we can again write down the same problem. So we have a tensor here, 
So this notation means it's the cubic form, right? So it's extending the quadratic form of the matrix. So you can again ask, can you find the direction that maximizes the cubic form in the tensor? And so now we can ask, uh, you know, this is again another non-convex optimization. How does this landscape look like? So it turns out for general tensors, this is very hard to analyze. So already we are hitting a roadblock. So we'll uh, first look at the class of tensors, which is orthogonal. So in the class of orthogonal tensors, you assume that each component, you know, these UI is one of the components, right? So it's orthogonal to all the other components. So if you, you know, lo look at this, this is nothing but an extension of the matrix decomposition. Right? So in the case of a matrix, you have outer product of the vector with itself. Now you have outer product of the vector uh, three times, right? because it's a third order tensor. So now that we have uh, this orthogonal tensor, what we can show is that um, you can look at what are the class of critical points and how many of them are local optima. So if you ask the number of critical points, you can already see that this is a much harder problem. So in fact, there can be an exponential number of uh, critical points where the gradient vanishes for the Lagrangian of this function. But fortunately, if it is an orthogonal tensor, you can show that the number of local optima are limited. So the number of local optima is just equal to the rank of the tensor. And the only local optima are these components. So this is almost like the boundary of hardness, right? Because you know you have this case of an explosion of critical points, right? There are numerous of them, and at the same time you can establish that almost all of them are saddle points. The only local optima are the components, and so this very special case, what you can show is because of this property, now you can exploit it to find the components with gradient descent. So you can, uh, you know, if you randomly initialize uh, the local search method, you can expect it to converge to one of these local optima. Right? You can subtract it out and repeat this and get all the components. So that's why for this class of orthogonal tensors, we can utilize the properties of this optimization landscape and come up with guaranteed recovery. And that's precisely what we can say. Right? So for orthogonal tensors, we can find the decomposition correctly. But we'll see that uh, tensors are, in fact, much more powerful than matrices. We can, in fact, have tensors which have decompositions where the representation need not be orthogonal. So you can have a lot more components than uh, that is possible in a matrix. So but can we now f uh, recover such tensor decompositions? Right? So can we? expand the class of tensors for which we can find the decomposition. And we'll see that, in fact, that is the case uh, through some other simple additional operations. So now if we think about tensors where I promise you that there exists a rank decomposition of this form. So now there are some set of components that make, this, make up this tensor. But the problem is these components need not be orthogonal to one another. So in that setting, how do we now find the decomposition? So if you directly look at the optimization landscape in the previous slide, that is too hard to analyze. So what we'll do instead is to convert the tensor. right? So we won't look at the original tensor. We'll orthogonalize it. Essentially, we'll multiply the tensor with some matrix W along each of the direction. And we'll form a new tensor that is, in fact, orthogonal. So with this new tensor being orthogonal, we can run the power method and get the decomposition. And now the question is, when is this an invertible transformation? So when I find the decomposition here, when can I revert back and find the original one? And that ends up po being possible when the set of components is linearly independent. Right? We always know when the set of components are linearly independent you can find an orthogonalizing transform of the same dimension, right? So same number of components. And so now you can see with this uh, strategy, 
we can find decomposition of a more general class. Right? So the only additional detail is to ask how to find this transformation. And starting with this tensor that's not orthogonal, I need to convert it into an orthogonal tensor. So it turns out that you can in fact compute this transformation you based on single value decomposition of any slice of the tensor. You take the matrix which is a slice of the tensor because it has the same shared decomposition you can again use that to find the single uh, you know find the orthogonalizing transform and obtain an orthogonal tensor. So I wanted to show this uh, to give you an idea that uh, you know, if you ask for the problem of finding this decomposition of tensor, that's a non-convex problem. But now you can see that using some simple algorithms, right, these are efficient steps, we can prove that we can correctly find the decomposition. Right, the first step was for the orthogonal setting, we can do that with the power method. And then we saw that for the more general case of non-orthogonal components, we can again recover them using this uh, additional steps which are again efficient to implement. So now you can see that tensors are much more informative, right? So if you had a matrix, you couldn't have found a unique non-orthogonal representation, but we can do that with tensors. So now we'll see how we'll exploit these properties of tensors in a range of applications. <laughs> So, so we have the algorithmic guarantees. Now we can see how we can employ them in learning. Uh, another part that is a bit more delicate for analysis of tensors is uh, the you know, performance under noise. We've understood matrix perturbation very well, but you know, analyzing a perturbation of nonlinear systems is much more challenging. And so some of the latest research is to ask, how much of noise can this withstand? What kind of noise can it you know, uh, have? And what are the algorithms to overcome that? So there's a lot of open questions in terms of making them robust. Uh, but that's another important aspect as well to make this a practical algorithm. So now that I've shown you a bit of the algorithmic side of how to decompose tensors, let's see how we can use them in learning applications. So first. I'll show you for unsupervised learning how we can uh, exploit these techniques. So the, in the case of unsupervised learning, you know, your task is to learn something about you know, your underlying data without having any labels. Right? So you have a set of, say, observation sex, and in general, you want to learn some probabilistic model and a set of parameters that you know, characterize it. So the classical frameworks are mainly of two categories. One is the Bayesian framework, the other is frequentist. So in the Bayesian one, you assume a random uh, set of model parameters, and you typically run sampling schemes such as MCMC. Right? The challenge is, in general, this tends to be slow in high dimensions, and how to speed it up is a, you know, there's a whole uh, set of research in that direction. The other framework which I'll be focusing on today is the frequentist one. So here you assume that model parameters are fixed and we want to use some objective function to find the best fit of model parameters for the data. Right? So the typical one is maximizing likelihood. So given your data, what are the set of parameters that maximize the likelihood? And this is where you know, non-convexity becomes a problem. So typically, this is a non-convex problem, and you have no guarantees of reaching the globally optimal solution. And you have heuristics such as uh, expectation maximization, but with no guarantees of reaching the globally optimal solution. So now, can we exploit uh, the algorithms based on matrices and tensors, which have the guarantee of getting to the globally optimal solution to solve the problem of unsupervised learning? So this is what we'll do. What we'll do is to replace the idea of maximizing likelihood to finding one of best tensor decomposition. As we saw before, we know how to solve for tensor decompositions efficiently. Right? But what is the property we want to preserve? We want to preserve that you know, they both have the same globally optimal solution, at least in the ideal case when they have an infinite set of samples generated from some underlying distribution. 
So you preserve the consistency uh, despite changing the objective function. Right? But the difference is this new objective function based on tensor decomposition, you know how to optimize. Right? So what you will do is you can compute a tensor that is based on the data. As I said before, we will compute certain higher order moments of data and then we will match that tensor to another tensor based on the parameters. Uh, you know, usually it will have some property as being low rank. And so we will try to find that best fit of parameters based on the tensor decomposition. Right? And so that way we can utilize the efficient uh, tensor decomposition algorithms that I described. And indeed, you know, if you have infinite data that will go to the right solution, but with limited data you need some conditions for it to succeed. So the idea is, I mean, if you have a small amount of approximation error for your data set, in that setting you can expect to get a solution that is good, right? So that's a good fit uh, for your data. So, so that's what we can now f uh, provide guaranteed solutions for unsupervised learning because we know how to solve uh, the problem of tensor decomposition. So let's now see what kinds of probabilistic models can we learn with this mechanism. So let me start with a simple model to give you the ideas of how to think about the moments and what kinds of uh, structures they encode. So this is the naive base model where you know, you have this hidden variable, right? And given condition on this hidden variable, all these observed variables x1, x2, and so on are conditionally independent. So we want to learn the parameters of this model. So one of the parameters is this matrix A, which says how the hidden states, you know, transform into observed states, right? So this is the conditional probability table of seeing observation states given the hidden states. And the other parameter is, of course, the marginal probability of the hidden distribution. So I've encoded the probabilities in terms of expectations using one hot encoding. This just makes it more convenient. So now we can ask, you know, given uh, now the data, how do we learn these parameters? So first we'll think of a matrix-based method. So the natural thing to think about is the correlation matrix, right? So I can look at a pair of my observed variables and ask how they are correlated. And then I can ask what kind of information about the parameters is this revealing. So if I look at the pairwise correlation matrix or the joint probability table of two of the variables, right, because of the conditional independence, I have the structure that it decomposes into rank one components where each rank one component corresponds to one of the columns of this conditional probability table. So I have this decomposition from my uh, pairwise moments. But the question is, can I find this decomposition uniquely? So you can do that only in the most limiting case, right? So only in the case where the different components, A1 and A2 and so on, are orthogonal to one another and there's an eigengap, only in that setting can you uniquely find the decomposition. So in all other settings, you cannot identify the decomposition. So just using pairwise moments is just not enough information for learning the parameters of this model. So this is why we now require higher order moments and we require the framework of tensors uh, to analyze them efficiently. So now we can ask the same with third order moments and we can now ask, can I now do the recovery? So indeed, now we know we can do that because we have the decomposition uh, in terms of rank one components where each component corresponds to one of the columns of the conditional probability table. So from the previous framework, we can do this recovery when there is linear independence of the components. So in all these previous cases that we saw, even when the columns are not orthogonal to one another, we can recover this um, efficiently. So with now higher order moments, we have identifiability, meaning we have enough information uh, for learning the parameters. And at the same time, we have efficient algorithms, meaning uh, we can actually get to the right solution. 
So that's what tensors can give us that matrices cannot. So now that we've resolved this naive base model, can we now look at a much more general class of models? How much can we push this, right? What class of models can we learn? So it turns out that we can extend this to the class of uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, where the difference is now the you know, hidden variable can have multiple different states, right? So it's a continuous variable instead of a discrete one. And the popular assumption is this being a Dirichlet variable. And it turns out that if you can adjust, uh, adjust a third or moments up to third order in a certain way and be able to do the recovery. So the idea is, I mean, you can use such a model for uh, modeling the set of hidden topics in a document, right? You observe words in a document and what are the set of hidden topics? Because you can have multiple topics in a document, you require uh, this uh, variable uh, that can encode now multiple different topics right in each document. And that's the idea. So again, we can show that you can uh, recover the uh, topic word matrix in this setting, which is the probability of seeing certain words given certain topics. You can recover them using tensor decomposition. And the tensor will encode co-occurrence probabilities of triplets of words. And there's some simple modifications to that. And by decomposing the tensor, you can recover the parameters. So you can learn this popular class of LDA models, and in fact, uh, you know, more, you know, even an extension of that using tensor methods. So we can also incorporate this for modeling social networks. So there, a popular uh, question is to learn about the people in the network. So you observe just the friendship links among the people. Can you learn about the hidden communities? And what we show is by looking at common friendships. So you can look at every node triplet and count the number of common friends and make some appropriate modifications. By decomposing that tensor, you can recover the underlying communities. So you can recover the hidden communities efficiently. So we also see this in practice. If we run this uh, for topic modeling and compare it against variational inference, the tensor method is much faster to run at the same time results in a better fitting model. And similarly for recovering the communities as well, we can, you know, we are much faster at the same time getting a better recovery. So tensor methods, because they have this guarantee of getting to the globally optimal solution and getting efficient, um, you know, uh, algorithms for doing so, we can guarantee both speed and accuracy, right? So in a way, this is best of both the worlds on having good, strong theoretical guarantees. And at the same time, this makes an impact in practice as well to get uh, you know, better algorithms and better solutions. So let me now show you how we can also push this methods forward more. So another aspect how we can utilize unsupervised learning is to learn representations. So one of the uh, you know, popular models is one of dictionary learning where you want to learn an unknown dictionary which can efficiently represent your measurements, you know, in terms of a sparse combination or so. And you can again, you know, learn this, you, you know, when uh, there is um, an incoherent dictionary. And in fact, you can also extend this to incorporate invariances. So in the morning we heard about, you know, the importance of invariances uh, in different applications especially you know, in images, you want the notion of shift invariance. And you can incorporate that with a convolutional model. So you zoom your signal is some convolution of some unknown set of filters with unknown coefficients. And you can recover such a decomposition by now constraining the coefficients of the tensor decomposition to be you know, shifts of one another. So you can tie them together and do that efficiently. So we utilize this to find embeddings of sentences. So while word embeddings are quite popular, finding embeddings of entire sentences is a much more challenging task. So we now you can utilize this convolutional model to find such embeddings. So what we did was we projected the data down to lower dimensions, right, that comes from sentences, and then we fit 
uh, this convolutional model in this uh, lower dimensional space. And once we decode the activations, we can use them for various downstream tasks. So one of the tasks is paraphrase detection to see if two sentences mean the same or not. And what we see is we get nearly the state of art results, but you, by, you know, while training on a much smaller number of samples compared to the state of art deep learning mechanisms that requires a much larger corpus. So you know, these tensor uh, algorithms could potentially also reduce the sample complexity of learning in many of these settings. So that's something to be explored even further. So another interesting application that's uh, very recent we've been exploring is can we also solve the more challenging problem of reinforcement learning with tensors, right? So the, in the reinforcement uh, learning, it's much more challenging because you have the environment changing as you're taking measurements. So whatever measurement you take could potentially change the environment, right? So just as you're displaying ads, in the internet that can change the user behavior. And so the new samples you collect will uh, you know, change depending on what you do, right? And at the same time, you have certain reward and you want to maximize this reward quickly. And uh, one of the popular frameworks is looking at partially observable Markov decision processes. So partial observation means there are hidden variables, right? The state is hidden from you and you cannot directly observe the environment. So while this happens in a lot of practical settings such as robotics, these POM-DP models are much harder to train. And that's why people have been mostly looking at Markov decision processes because they're much more tractable. But what we now show is with tensor methods, we can in fact resolve for partially observable processes. And uh, I know the idea there again on how to learn the parameters is looking at conditional independence of consecutive sets of measurements. It's much more involved than the naive base case that I showed you, but the idea is again similar. You know, you have to exploit conditional independence to come up with tensor structures that have good decomposition properties. And with that, in fact, you can use the tensor method in this idea of uh, episodic learning. So you learn in a certain episode, you update your decision rules, which is the planning part, and then you proceed in forward. So with that, in fact, we can show that we get a very efficient regret. We get uh, that in, you know, in time, uh, a set of T steps, you get a root T regret, which is the best you can expect. And you can also get, show that the regret is efficient in terms of the dimensionality scaling. You know, it's quite comparable uh, to the, uh, the dimensions if you had if you directly observe the states, right? If you instead have the Markov decision process, you expect a lower regret because the state is not hidden from you. And what we show is we can do, you know, co quite close to that despite having a hidden state. So these tensor methods can now reveal these hidden states efficiently and also do it fast in order to get uh, to a good reward. So we also see this in practice. This is the popular Atari gameplay. And here uh, you see that uh, this is the bot. There is the apples and the poison. And uh, you can again, you know, so the, in the usual framework, the whole screen is given to the deep learning framework. But what we instead did was, let's give just a single window, the window forward to it uh, as the input. Right, this is much more realistic in an actual ground for a robot. You would only have limited observation. So in that setting, what we see is our POM-DP model can get to a better reward and be faster compared to the uh, you know, neural network setting. So you know, incorporating these hidden variables can have real benefits uh, for uh, multiple applications, including this challenging task of reinforcement learning. So in the last five minutes, so these tensor methods indeed, you know, we can show uh, have, uh, uh, you know, can uh, overcome non-convexity and come up with guaranteed results and at the same time can give good performance in practice. So let me also now quickly tell you uh, challenges about a general non-convex optimization. 
right? So in most non-convex problems, we cannot expect what happened with matrices and tensors. There we could guarantee getting the globally optimal solution. So since can, we cannot expect that for general problems, what, what else can we say, right? So can we at least go to a locally optimal solution? It turns out even that is a hard problem. And it's hard because there are saddle points, right? So the idea is you have your usual set of local optima, but in addition, you have these saddle points where you know locally you can improve, right? So these are points where if you move in certain directions, you know you can improve the objective function and ultimately escape uh, that saddle point. But the challenge is how to do this. As you have uh, the problem in higher dimensions, again, doing this in a low order polynomial time is challenging, right? So ultimately, if you run gradient descent, it will ultimately escape the saddle point. But to do it in bounded time is the challenge. And uh, let me just very briefly tell you some of the existing frameworks for doing that, right? So the idea, as I said, is saddle point is one where the gradient vanishes. So the natural thing to do is to look at the next uh, derivative, which is the Hessian, right? So we can ask based on the properties of Hessian, can we determine how to escape it? And the idea is if it's a saddle point, yeah, and if it's a not a degenerate saddle point, you have the Hessian being both positive and negative eigenvalues, right? So if it's a minimization problem, the direction of uh, negative eigenvalue is the one where the objective will improve. So if you move along the negative eigenvalue, you are guaranteed to escape the uh, saddle point. And that's the basic idea that by now if, uh, studying the Hessian, you can come up with directions for escape, right? And in fact, if you did Newton method here, that's terrible for non-convex optimization. A Newton method would in fact converge to a saddle point because it doesn't distinguish between local optima and saddle. Right, so convex methods, convex optimization doesn't have saddle points and you don't have to worry. But for non-convex, running Newton method is bad. But on the other hand, now there are these essentially uh, you know, adaptive versions of Newton method, which is the Nesterov's um, cubic regularization method that is guaranteed to escape such saddle points. And uh, my student Farang in the audience, in fact, showed last year uh, that uh, you don't even need the Hessian information. You can run stochastic gradient descent with sufficient amount of noise and you can still escape such saddle points. So this is a nice thing that we can you know, avoid the expensive Hessian and still do that. So, but there are more challenges beyond this. So you know, not all saddle points need to be degenerate, you know, non-degenerate. You can have degenerate saddle points. And um, this is where uh, you know, we need weaker notions. So that's in the recent cold, upcoming cold paper. Given that I'm out of time, I will not get into the details. But the main idea is in many cases, in fact, they are quite ubiquitous. You can come up with examples where you can have saddle points that are not determined by just the Hessian. And you need higher order information. In fact, you can have an entire manifold of such saddle points, especially when you have over-specified models. So in this example here, if even though the training data can be fit with one neuron, we now look at a network with two neurons. And in those cases, you now have stuck in this entire manifold of saddle points, and it takes quite a long time to escape it. And people have observed this in practice. And uh, a recent work of the ours says how we can avoid this by exploiting higher order information and still being able to do that in polynomial time. So to conclude, uh, what I tried to show you was a window into the challenges of non-convex optimization. I mean, given that now a majority of people are running non-convex methods, right, especially in industry, in deep learning, we are running non-convex methods, there is uh, you know, even more a need to come up with a strong, robust theory for saying when we can expect globally optimal solutions, when we can at least escape saddle points, when we can have fast convergence, and how we can do this in high dimensions. 
And we saw that matrix and tensor problems are a very special class of non-convex problems where we can achieve the best of all the worlds. And at the same time, they can be very uh, relevant for a number of machine learning problems. So as Outlook, we indeed have a number of challenges to making these algorithms robust, running them on large scale, and more generally thinking about unified conditions under which non-convex optimization can be expected to succeed. So this is my excellent group and uh, you know, a, a shortened list of my uh, awesome collaborators and again, resources to many of my papers and so Thank you. We have time for a few questions. <laughs> Very nice talk. Um, so at the beginning, uh, you were saying you assume infinite data sizes and, and try to uh, equate the empirical tensor to the theoretical tensor. And you suggested that if the sample size was small, this might break down in some way. Is there a way of diagnosing ways that's failing? And can you characterize like how much data you need for this to work well? Or, or Right, so, so you know, we can come up with uh, finite sample concentration bounds, right, for the tensors and then we, we can analyze these uh, tensor methods and know how much of perturbation it can withstand and still preserve to some extent the uh, optimality structure. So the challenge is if you look at general tensors, that's NP hard, so if you have a large amount of noise, you could go into an intractable problem. And so a lot of analysis is to ask how, my, how can I still avoid and come up with guarantees. And then the, with the, along with the concentration bounds, we can say, what is the sample complexity, how many samples we need. And that's still a low order polynomial. Uh, but it's still an open question to ask, can I push this, you know, how much, uh, ca how can I make this is a better bond? Uh, are you trading computational speed for um, less sample efficiency? So maximum likelihood is obviously optimal from a yes. sample efficiency point of view, but computationally it can be bad, that's like you said. So is there, are you actually trading one for the other and can you, quantify so, that? I mean, the thing is, the trade-off curve is not completely continuous, right? We need at least a certain number of yeah. samples to say what we can do, because if, uh, and that's been, uh, I think, uh, in all, you know, our analysis and elsewhere as well. The idea is if the, uh, you know, data set is quite far from the model class we're trying to wit, fit, that's when it's a hard problem. When they're close enough, you know, it becomes more tractable. That's the intuition. More questions? So I'll, I'll follow up then with just one uh, follow on to Kevin's, uh, which is that, so since we know that maximum likelihood is in some sense uh, asymptotically optimal uh, sample efficiency, um, it, does it make sense to, f to follow on tensor methods with those always or, yeah. or sometimes? When, can so, you comment yeah, on that? So that's a great question, yes. I mean, you can uh, initialize, for instance, you know, with these moment-based estimators and then ask, you know, like if I run the uh, EM or other procedures, will it improve, right? So that's one approach. Then there is also this class of two-stage uh, estimators. You know, there's the classical work of Hansen, and there's also now a recent work by Sain Mukherjee and others uh, trying to use that to improve the statistical efficiency of the moment estimators directly and having asymptotic efficiency. Uh, but there's still, I mean, you know, I think great questions there to you know, completely understand the trade-off between both computational and statistical efficiency. Let's thank Anima again. Yeah, thanks, Art.